Well, thank you, uh, Merlin. Here in the back, we're good? Okay, good. Um, appreciate the opportunity to come. I've heard uh, as other speakers that I've heard about this conference for a number of years, never had a chance to come, so I uh, appreciate the, the invitation. I will echo Ron Ball's comments. I was chair of the Minnesota Nutrition Conference for about 10 years. There is a lot of work behind the scenes, so uh, thank the organizing committee for the time they put in. I know at other universities they probably reward you a lot more for that committee work than to do at Minnesota, but uh, it's important to the industry, I think. So I'd like to, uh, as I start uh, this presentation, uh, uh, thank my co-author, uh, Yushi Lee. Yushi is a uh, uh, swine behaviorist and welfare specialist uh, working with us there at Morris at the Research and Outreach Center and uh, has put a new um, aspect into our research. About uh, uh, 2000, we got some funding from the legislature to build new swine facilities, and part of that project was to look at alternative housing, uh, group housing, group housing in gestation, group housing in lactation. Um, we didn't necessarily, were smart enough to see all this changes coming from the markets that were going to be pushed out of stalls, maybe, into group pens. It was more driven for some smaller niche uh, producers, but it's kind of been fortuitous that we've had a, a long track record of data in group housing to, to draw upon. Of course, we all know that uh, society, and if uh, we listen to Bill Weldon's comments, 1% uh, of the society maybe is pushing markets, market segments and ultimately rolling down to producers that we need to probably think about moving away from individual stalls. Not going to argue the pros and cons of that. Let's just accept that for today that we might have to make that change. How are we going to do that? And that's been our focus at Morris is how do we help producers make that transition? What are the things we have to consider? What do we have to worry about? If we think about the people that are really pushing this, they're probably thinking of group housing something like this. Very pastoral, very calm and serene. Uh, we've got sows out on nice green grass, group lactation, that kind of thing. We know it's much more complex than that when we try to move from an individual stall setting to, to group housing. Um, we know that there are challenges in terms of aggression and feed, feed management and so forth um, as we try to make these changes. In reality, when we think about making the change in the industry, we're thinking about these kind of changes. Individual stalls and environmentally controlled housing uh, where we can control individual feed intake and so forth. Or a group housing setting, again, in environmentally controlled buildings, no bedding, no grass. Maybe not what a lot of the consumers and society envision or think is group housing, is what they're asking for. But certainly I think the many people would say uh, that are pushing for it are, this is an improvement because the sow has movement. She's not locked up into a, a small stall. So as we think about how do we make these changes, how do we advise producers to, to move, make this transition, when Merlin and Gary called and asked me to put together this presentation, I thought about feeding, I thought about management, and I boiled it down into kind of two large uh, buckets, so to speak. The first one is if we change uh, in terms of feeding, are there changes in the biological needs? Are there changes in performance that would drive the need to change our, uh, our nutritional programs. And then there's also this idea of feeding to address management and welfare needs. And to me, that's, that's somewhat different than feeding for biological needs. Uh, there are some other things that we might uh, think about that uh, a certain level of feeding and nutrients supports optimal reproductive performance, but it might not necessarily meet the welfare needs and the satiety and uh, the well-being of the sow, and we might have to think about feeding a little different to satisfy that higher level of requirement. We'll try to talk about those two big segments here this morning. So first, let's, uh, let's delve into this biological need. How are we going to uh, supply that? First thing I went to is, what are the differences in performance? Are there differences in performance expected when we move from stalls to group housing? Here's some work we did uh, on a commercial farm in North Dakota, just reported at the Midwest Animal Science meetings this past spring. Um, we had between 120 to 325 sows per treatment. And what we did is we went into this commercial farm and they asked us, what are we going to do if we lose gestation stalls? How are we going to retrofit our barn? We don't want to lose 
uh, sow inventory. So you've got to do it within the footprint of what we have. So that was the parameters they gave us. And we looked at sows in small pens, uh, six sows per pen, or sows in large pens. That was 26 sows per pen, and compared them to sows in standard gestation stalls. And I won't go through all the details of the study, but the point here is live worn litter size in that, that um, study was not different across the three housing systems. I'll point out that those sows were uh, diagnosed pregnant by ultrasound before they were moved into gestation stall or gestation pens. And basically, the gestation housing was from pregnancy confirmation until farrowing. So no difference here in terms of uh, litter size produced. A study that we ran at our Waseca Research and Outreach Center um, just uh, finished up not too long ago, where we looked at sows in stalls or compared that to a dynamic group pen. Dynamic group pen, in other words, where we're bringing sows in and taking sows out. Sows get mixed twice during the gestation period. There's an electronic sow feeder in that, in that pen. And we see that there's a slight tendency for lower litter size in that dynamic group. Sows were mixed into that group within one week of mating. So that's a little bit different than the North Dakota study. And, uh, but still not a huge difference in terms of litter size produced, uh, the litter size of, of those sows. If you look at some of the literature reviews, uh, McGlone's done, done one, uh, Rhodes has one, a couple. When they look at a variety of studies, look at a kind of a meta-analysis, in general, litter performance, litter size is about the same whether you're in stalls or in group pens. Uh, there may be a chance for more catastrophes in group pens, and that could be related to a lot of things. But I, the argument I'm trying to make here is there's not going to be a big change in litter size, so that probably does not warrant a big change in the nutritional needs of that sow just based on her performance. We wouldn't expect that the amino acids, uh, vitamins and mineral requirement of those sows would change dramatically if we move to groups. However, energy might be a little bit different. And uh, here I went to the NRC model and um, said what, just use it as a way to predict what the effects of the environment might be on the energy requirements of the sow. Others have done this, uh, the National Pork Board, uh, the Kansas State group, put out uh, a fact sheet not too long ago doing kind of a similar exercise. I assumed we had a parity two sow. She was 165 kilos at mating and 225 at farrowing. Uh, she was gonna farrow 13 and a half pigs. The diet that uh, we were gonna feed was uh, 3,300 kcals per kilo. 9% per, uh, fermentable fiber, and assume that to be about 5% feed wastage. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. So I said, well, um, let's look at the effect of temperature, and let's look at the effect of temperature installed sows. So if we go from 20 degrees C, which is the lower critical temperature for a stalled sow, and we put her, put her in a colder environment, drop the temperature 10 degrees C, we're going to have an increase of her daily, daily metabolizable energy requirement of about 2,100 kilocalories. Well, that's about 650 grams of that feed that we're going to feed just because we lowered the temperature in the barn. We've got to feed her to stay warm. She's experiencing about 10 degrees of coldness. She's 10 degrees below her lower critical temperature. So you've got to start burning feed to keep herself warm. Well, how does that, and this was, of course, called sows. How does that look if we go to group house sows? We look group house sows, this difference is not that, that great. This is an increase of only about uh, 700 kilocalories. Same sow going from 20 degrees C to 10 degrees C, increase in requirement of 720 kilocalories um, or about 200 grams of feed. Why the difference? Well, this sow has a lower critical temperature of about 16 degrees C. So she's not feeling cold until it gets to 16. So when she gets to 10, she's only got 6 degrees C to worry about trying to stay warm. And the reason being is those sows can huddle together, they stay together, they can conserve body heat, where the sow on uh, stalls can't necessarily do that. As well, if we just uh, compound the problem in stalled sows, if the floors are wet or something, that's where the sow is. She cannot get away from that. At least sows and pens, they might be able to choose a microenvironment to help conserve some of that, that heat. So uh, in group house sows, 
this coldness doesn't affect them quite as, quite as drastically. So now what's it like when we can take a sow from stalls to put her in, in groups at 10 degrees C? We see that uh, the energy requirement actually drops about 1,400 kcals per day, or about 500 grams of feed, or 15% savings. So moving to group, theoretically, we could feed them less energy. The requirement is 15% lower, assuming everything else is equal. It's just temperature that changes. And we know that that's not the case. There are other changes that happen when we move from stalls to groups. One of those changes is activity. We move the sow out of the stall. Society is saying they've got to have an opportunity to move around, interact with their pen mates, and so forth. So that's going to increase activity. Uh, measures in the literature, if you look at some of the Illinois work that uh, Janine Selig Johnson has, has published, uh, those activity levels increase from about 120, 130 minutes per day. And activity in a stalled sow means standing up and maybe chewing in bars and doing something, but uh, something other than just laying down. If you move them to group housing, it increases to somewhere around 240 minutes per, per day. Um, variation, of course, a lot of things will affect that, but I chose for this exercise 240 minutes. And so as we increase activity, um, we're going to have an increase of energy requirements on the order of about 300 kilocalories per day. Um, that's about 100 grams of feed or a 4 to 5 percent increase in your energy needs. So we had a 15 percent savings, allow them to huddle together, but we burn up some of that by the increased activity. What happens if we use some, some straw bedding? I know that's not going to happen probably in our systems in the near future in the U.S. Um, well, I'm upset about that. We know that's not likely, but it does have an effect on energy requirements. If we do have bedding and the bedding is kept dry and properly managed, uh, that energy requirement is going to drop um, in the neighborhood of uh, 500 kilocalories or uh, the re feed requirement about 200 grams of feed. So if we add some bedding, we can save some energy again because the lower critical temperature of these sows with bedding drops to about 12 degrees C. So there's some savings. So I feel a little bit like an economist here. On one hand, we got some energy savings. On the other hand, we've got some energy requirements that increase. So how do we balance that out? Uh, this is my attempt to look at that balance. On one side, when we move them to groups, there's energy savings because they huddle. The lower critical temperature, that's a good thing. On the other side, we have some energy costs. They're moving around. There's more activity. There's also potential for feed wastage. And I put a question mark beside that because that's a real wild card in terms of how much feed wastage is there going to be, how much can we manage. Uh, obviously, we want to we minimize that as much as possible. Um, and so in, on balance, if I had to say, what are you going to do when you move to, to, stop, or to uh, pens, I suspect you're probably going to have to increase the feeding rates. And reports from the field, just kind of anecdotal kind of things, um, 5 to 10 percent increase in the feed requirements to maintain body condition on the sows. At the end of the day, I mean, we could use a model and figure out this is how many kilos we should feed and so forth, but things that, that Ron talked about, you know, body size, body condition, are the floors wet, are they drafty, what's the room temperature, all those things are going to affect the requirement. So at the end of the day, the manager, whoever's responsible for those sows, has to be a fall in body weight, body condition of those sows. Are they coming into farrowing the way you expect them? What is their sow performance, their longevity? So it still is a little bit of a moving target. We can use the model as a, uh, a guide, but we have to, to follow the herd and find out what the end result is. So that's kind of the biological side of things. What about some of the welfare things? We know that um, when we move sows to groups, we've got to deal with aggression, aggression at higher levels. And this is something that I think uh, most of the consumers that are pushing for group housing, they're totally oblivious to this. Um, we had a uh, U.S. senator visit our research center uh, about a year ago, and we talked about our group housing. And she said, oh, so it's like bullying in the schools. I said, well, yeah, the little sows get beat on. 
and that's not really good for their welfare. So how do we deal with this aggression? There's aggression at mixing, there's aggression, in, aggression at feeding time. Um, how do we take care of that? And usually the aggression is primarily directed at the subordinate sows, the young sows, the thin sows, the disadvantaged sows. And of course, they're part of the whole herd production, so if they're not doing well, your herd average is gonna come down. So we have spent a fair bit of time, Yushi in particular, trying to figure out how do we control, not eliminate, but control, mitigate uh, aggression, how do we make it at least manageable. And she did something that was fairly simple. She said uh, those parity one sows are the ones that are most uh, at risk because they're, they're light, they're young, uh, they've just come through their first lactation, maybe feeling a little, little stressed out here. And so what she did, she says, let's take those parity one sows. We can put them in a sow pen, which is kind of normal industry practice. You fare the litter, you're a sow, you go with the old gals. <clears throat> and she looked at those, uh, those sows in pens. If we looked at the faring rate of all the sows in the study in the sow pens, 83%. But the pairing rate of the P1 sows fell to 67%. They were on the bottom of the pecking order. Their scratches and scars were higher than any other sows in the group. The old sows, they failed at 88%. The alternative treatment was, let's take those P1 sows, put them in with the gilts. Now they move from the bottom of the pyramid to the top. What happens to their performance? Well, all females is 88% fairing, but the fairing rate for those P1 sows jumped to 94%. They were the top of the heap. And when we first shared this data with some people, said, well, yeah, the gilts got the snot pounded out and they didn't throw very well. Well, actually, the gilts did quite well. There was um, these parity one sows and gilt pens. They didn't have as many scars, didn't have as many injuries. They were winning the fights. Or over here, they were getting pounded on. And it didn't seem to, to, to negatively affect the gilts. The gilts, they just knew they were going to lose, so the fights ended quickly and it was over. So something very simply management act, um, activity that can help deal with that aggression, particularly at mixing. To reinforce the idea that those disadvantaged cells can be a problem, uh, the Danish group looked at um, 550 focal cells located in 14 different commercial herds across the country. And they looked at the uh, back fat gain in millimeters per week in the first three weeks post mating. And their idea was that this is going to be a proxy measure of what was their access to feed, how are they dealing with the group penning and so forth. Sows were put in pens at weaning, were mated in pens, and gestated in pens. And basically, they said if a sow gained uh, just pick 0.5 millimeters per week of back fat, they had a fairing rate of about 95%. But if that sow lost 0.5 millimeters of back fat, their fairing rate was about 90%. So a 5% difference in fairing rate because a sow wasn't thriving, so to speak, in that group pen. They also looked at when feed got dropped, they watched sows for, for uh, 25 minutes after feed was dropped and, and registered whether sows were up and eating or whether they were scour or cowling in the corner or, or were pushed out of the feeding area. If sows ate, less than 20% of the time during their observation, fairing rate was 62%. If sows ate more than 20% of the time, what they observed, the fairing rate was 91%. So trying to bring home the point that those young disadvantaged sows need to be paid attention to in a group setting, we need to try to accommodate them and make sure they get up and they get, up, uh, get their feed and um, don't be uh, victims of the mature sows or the, the, the dominant females in the group. So how can we deal with aggression? <laughs> um, a lot of different management practices. Some of them have some data behind them. Some of them are kind of anecdotal, kind of make sense type things. Um, some places when you're in commercial production, you do what you think you can to, to make things better. Uh, some things that have been suggested reducing aggression and mixing, mix sows after the confirmed pregnant. There are data out there that says that once that sow is under a heavy progesterone influence, she's less aggressive and, and fighting is, is uh, not as um, intense. Increased feed intake for a few days before and two days after mixing, 
just have them full. One of the, the uh, sources of aggression in group housing is the limit feeding. And sows are always hungry, so the dominant sows want to get more feed. It creates aggression. Uh, mixed previously grouped sows, they can remember each other through a lactation. So when you bring them back, if they were grouped before, if you can group them in the same groups again, that's helpful. Maybe not terribly practical, but if you can, uh, do so. Keep yolks and P1 sows together. We already talked about that. Introduce young females to the pen before the older females. Kind of give the young sow the home court advantage. The old sows are coming into their turf. That helps level the playing field somewhat. Provide hides for sows. I'll show you a slide in one of that. Inclusive, include a vexus mm, vibor in the pen. There are data on both sides of this one. We use this at Morris. I think it helps it quite a bit. He becomes the center. He's the dominant, uh, pers uh, dominant pig in the pen. Kind of breaks up some fights. They're worried about avoiding him. There are other uh, studies that say it doesn't really matter. It doesn't do any good. So, um, and last thing, Yushi uh, did a study a few years ago looking at tryptophan with the idea if we increase the tryptophan content of the diet, um, it can help in kind of sedation. Uh, data have been um, reported in nursery pigs and finishing pigs. It helps reduce aggression. Uh, we did a study uh, increasing the tryptophan content by over two, per, two times NRC requirement in limit-fed sows, in dynamic groups with electronic sow feeders had no effect. I think the limit feeding just overwhelmed the ability of tryptophan to, to have any positive benefits. So here's a picture of the, the hides. Uh, granted, this is straw in a group housing, uh, kind of a hoop barn type setting. But the idea is that um, these big bales of straw act as a place for the sow to duck behind. 75% of sow fights only last eight feet. They only, the sow only chase for about eight feet. And then she tires out and figures I won, so uh, no problem. So that young sow, she can duck around that bale or duck around some kind of a stub fence or something like that, and the fight can, can be dissipated. As I said, there's fighting at mixing. There's also aggression at feeding. Here's a slide from uh, Franklin Carnes out of Ontario in a commercial system using uh, what we call like a stub wall or a stub fence. And then there's this uh, kind of cross-shaped uh, fence in the middle of the pen. This can help um, provide a place for sows to duck around. And also, they drop feed on each side of this fence and in each corner of this uh, cross. And that apply, uh, uh, provides kind of a, a protected feeding area for sows to, to eat in and helps reduce some of the aggression at feeding. Um, as I said, that aggression is really driven by limited resources. The sows want to eat more, they're hungry, or of course we're limit feeding them to limit weight gain or control that weight gain. And so as a result, somebody wants to get more feed than they, they really need to have. So how could we deal with that aggression? Um, one way is to try to make them feel fuller. And so a lot of people have looked into how do we bulk up the diet? How do we use fiber to try to limit that aggression, or uh, in particular, the data reported in the literature focuses on stereotypic behaviors. The idea that if they're limit fed, they're frustrated, they're hungry, they express these stereotypic behaviors. If we use a lot of fiber, we can reduce that. I'm going to be a little risky here today and uh, make a stretch to say we can look at that stereotypic behavior and make some suggestions about what might happen with, aggression, happen with aggression. There's very few studies in the literature that say, how can we manipulate diet to reduce aggression? And so I have to make a little bit of a stretch for you today. If we look at some high fiber diets, uh, some earlier work uh, looking at um, a barley wheat control diet, um, a high fiber diet that basically contains 60% of fibrous ingredients, so things like oat hulls, alfalfa meal, um, uh, sugar beet pulp, or a very high fiber diet, 89% of fibrous ingredients in that diet, and looked at stereotypic behaviors in the blue bars. As we increase the fiber content, we decrease the amount of uh, time spent in stereotypic behaviors, and we increase the amount of time the sows are inactive. And inactive is kind of a proxy for they're sleeping, they're laying down, they're comfortable, they're content. 
<laughs> but you notice if we take the control diet and just provide it ad lib, that's where we get the biggest impact on reduction in stereotypic behaviors and increase in, in inactivity. Basically, you full feed them. They're comfortable. There's no reason to, to um, express those stereotypic behaviors. And I'm making the stretch. I would assume no reason to fight as well. There is one study, or actually two studies that I know of. Um, a group here from the UK looked at fibrous diets as they might affect aggression and measured that directly. Um, control diet was a uh, barley soy based diet. The high fiber diet contained 15% uh, sugar beet pulp and 30% uh, soy hulls. So a mix of a soluble and an insoluble fiber in those, that diet. And um, they measured um, activity and aggression four hours after sows were introduced into this dynamic pen. Sows were, used, were fed uh, with an electronic sow feeder. And basically, they found significant uh, increases in lying behavior, decrease in standing, decrease in exploration, which would suggest the high fiber diet contented those sows more. They were just a little more, uh, a little calmer. No significant difference in aggressive uh, encounters in total. But when they looked at head thrusts and biting activity or biting behaviors, there was a significant reduction with the high fiber diet. So that would suggest that maybe that high fiber is having some beneficial effects in terms of aggression. But the data aren't consistent. Oh, let me back up here. The reason that there, there may be um, some benefits, as I mentioned, they had sugar beet pulp in that diet a highly soluble fiber, highly fermentable fiber. And if you look at some of um, Dutch work, where they fed a, a barley, wheat, soy diet, and meal fed at 7 o'clock in the morning and followed uh, plasma glucose relative to the baseline, we see that there's a dramatic increase in glucose concentration and plasma in those control-fed sows that drops back by, um, by 9 o'clock in the morning to baseline, chatters around there, and actually is significantly lower out here at um, 2 in the afternoon, and then kind of levels off. So basically, the control-fed sows get this big spike of glucose, and then drops the baseline and stays there, or drops below baseline for the rest of the day till the next feeding. Compared that to a high-fiber diet, measure glucose, and here at, at 9 o'clock, at noon, and late in the day, plasma glucose is above baseline. So that, uh, that uh, fiber, that diet is digested a little slower, maintains a more steady uh, plasma glucose, and presumably those sows late in the day won't feel quite as hungry and be so worked up. And if they looked at behavior of those sows, we see that postural changes, which would be a suggestion of uh, whether the sow is content or not, there was more postural changes in the control-fed sows compared with the um, sugar beet-fed sows. So, um, here, this would suggest that soluble fibers in particular might have some benefit in terms of altering behavior of the sow, but it's not consistent. Here's some work, uh, recent work published looking at various fiber sources, 21% uh, pectin, 45% um, potato pulp, 33% sugar beet pulp, many fiber sources that are fairly soluble and fermentable, and uh, compared that with a, um, a wheat barley control diet and looked at the motivation of feeding. Basically, sows were fed these different diets, and they had to press a, a button a certain number of times to have access to 30 grams of feed, and measured how many rewards they got and how aggressively they were motivated to feed. So the idea is, if we fed these higher fiber diets, they should be more content and less motivated to feed, and I'm making that stretch, maybe less motivated to fight. I find that these three fiber sources had no impact on the number of rewards that those sows work for during their feeding period. But if they mixed all three of these fiber sources together in equal proportions and then allowed the sows semi ad lib access to feed, so um, they had six one hour periods the sows could eat whatever they wanted and have access to the feeder, they didn't have much motivation to feed. Again, they ate more feed, they were more content. If we look at this data a different way, number of responses for the last reward. There were sows that were pressing that button 70 to 85 times to get 30 grams of feed. I, I don't know what, what you think, but to me, that seems like motivation. Um, 
where the sows that were ad lib fed, much lower motivation to feed. So again, I'm stretch, stretching this to say, maybe it's the amount of feed that's more important in terms of re reducing aggression than is the fiber source. We looked at some more practical diets um, a few years ago saying, well, how high of a fiber source can we put in, highest concentration, we can still get it to work through feed bins, through feed lines, not plug in feeders and so forth. And uh, this is work we did at our Wasika station. And we looked at a corn soy control versus a diet with 40% soy hulls fed in uh, isoenergetic, isonitrogenous um, amounts and found that uh, if we increased the fiber content, it took the soils longer to eat the diet. It was bulkier. Um, but when we looked at stereotypic behaviors in stalled soils, no effect. So it would suggest that at least this fiber source that's fairly insoluble in its nature uh, didn't have any effect on, on changing behavior of sows. We recently uh, did a study that, that Yushi helped us with looking at uh, distillers grains as a, a, a source of uh, fiber that might influence behavior of the sows. Basically, corn soy diet again versus sows that have been through at least one reproductive cycle of 40% distillers in gestation, 20% distillers in lactation, and then we measured the behavior of these sows uh, in terms of aggression uh, the 24 hours after sows were mixed into the group pens. And basically, we found that if we looked at frequency of fights, fights per sow per hour, no significant difference, tended to numerically be a little higher for the distillers fed sows. But total dura duration of fighting, seconds a sow was involved in a fight per hour, significantly increased by feeding distillers. Not the way we wrote the book. We figured it was supposed to go down because they were higher fiber, it was a bulkier feed, they should be more satiated. Don't know why it worked that way. And the thing that uh, throws an additional curve at us is we had the same treatments in stalled sows running side by side, and when we fed uh, the distillers diets to the stalled sows, of course they weren't fighting, they were in stalls, but when we measure stereotypic behaviors, feeding distillers decreased stereotypic behaviors, increased lying time, it did the things that we expected it would. It made her more satisfied and satiated. So it seemed like this fiber source might interact with, with housing type. So, summary of some of the aggression controls. Um, dietary fiber, I'm not real convinced that we've got it figured out in terms of how dietary fiber might reduce aggression. I know there's studies going on around the country still looking at this. If fiber is going to work, I think the highly fermentable fiber is the, the fiber choice to be honed in on. I think restricted feeding uh, seems to overwhelm the beneficial effects of fiber. In other words, we just can't get by the fact that we're not feeding or much feed. Um, Non-competitive feeding systems are going to be most useful in trying to keep that, uh, keep that aggression under control. Of course, that increases our expense. Just a few quick comments about stockmanship. And I think those are very important. Workers must adapt to group housing, just as sows have to adapt. Uh, workers need to have an animal-directed approach. Look for those disadvantaged sows. Look for those sows that might have problems. Uh, animal care might be intuitive in some people. Some of us that grew up on farms and your dad was kicking your butt down to the highway kind of thing because you missed this one. You're more in tune to that. A lot of our workforce didn't have those experiences, so we need to teach that to them. Use a consistent approach to animal care. The National Pork Board has, um, uh, we've been involved in a group looking at six different housing systems and feeding systems and developed a whole series of fact sheets and walk through um, guides to help uh, manage those systems. Those should be coming out hopefully in the next couple months. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip some of the, the stuff on walk through the barns and just uh, summarize by saying dietary energy needs uh, may change when we move to groups because of this one hand or the other type thing. Um, dietary approaches to reduce aggression probably require some kind of increased feed intake. That's maybe not going to be real palatable and doable because of some other uh, considerations, but certainly we could, should consider a non-competitive feeding system. Stockmanship is key to the system, um, and to bring that point home, it's easy to see the big things, the obvious things. We're not going to miss those, but what about the small things? 
study that picture. You see the small things. And if you don't, I'll give you a hint. I use this slide when I'm talking about rodent control on farms. There's a mouse watching the cat who's watching four mice. So we need to pick up the small things as well. So thank you for your attention.